All right. I think that's about to be time's up. I've got some pizza in my face, <sighs> some water in my poor abused body, and let's have a look at what the polls shook out for. So it looks like there just aren't that many people voting, um, which is fine. That's, that's completely okay with me. Or else Straw Poll is disregarding a bunch of votes for some reason of its own that it's not going to tell me. Um, but by the looks of it, Noxus is winning out with a very small margin over the Freljord. And so the Freljord is where we go now. Uh, Noxus, rather. Noxus is the place where we go now. The Freljord maybe is next. We'll figure that out. We'll do a, we'll do a, a, a poll for that by the time that comes around. So, let's begin with the, well... The obvious one, Draven. I believe that's how you're supposed to pronounce it, Draven. And of course, the very first thing Draven is doing in his artwork is being a complete fuckboy. <sighs> Makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> anyway, lovely bit of artwork here. Um, interestingly, very different from from like Noxian art in a lot of ways, specifically because of course this is a Draven artwork. So you get much like you remember that Timo piece um, that where like we all of a sudden we're in this fairy tale aesthetic thing. Kind of the same thing going on here with Draven. Like there's a lot of saturated color, there's a lot of brightness, there's a lot of kind of light and playfulness about this particular rendering. There's not that much framing going on really. Um, there's, there's kind of a little bit of it where, like, this bridge area creates, like, a, a box frame that kind of includes Draven, and then you get his spinning axis spinning free of that. But not really. Like, this is more of a flat illustration. Like, it uses fewer of those principles that we've been discussing up until so far. Although it's still, of course, it has that powerful use of especially sort of golden hour lighting um, to really highlight the characters. I do wish we could get a bit more sense of the girl, because, like... I'm not sure where she's putting her weight, really. Like, is she... Because she's got that leg lifted up, and she's kind of in Draven's arm. So is she standing on her other leg? That's a little bit unclear, but that's like, like that's a minor detail. That's only really in this little part of the picture, so that doesn't matter so much. I do like the dynamic between the two, where it's like Draven is clearly being a complete fucking fuckboy, but she's clearly also into that. Like... She's clearly also into that. Do I have all the cards? Yes, yes I do. I have all the cards because all of the cards are unlocked during the last um, 24 hours of this first preview patch. So everybody has all the cards right now. But yeah, it's like, I like that she's into it. Like, I feel like if, if Draven had been like putting on this act with a girl who clearly didn't want anything to do with him, that would just have been really uncomfortable and shitty. But the fact that she's into it, like, she's playing along, she's flirting, she's having fun, they're having a good time. That makes it nice. Like, that that makes it enjoyable. <laughs> Draven dyes his hair. Yeah, of course he does. Or maybe it's just a younger Draven, who knows. I do like his chin, like, the, the big, fat, balls chin that he's got going on. And then moving on to Draven in the arena, where he seems to have just killed a minotaur, which is, like... Okay, that's oh, less cool. Less cool, dude, but there we go. But yeah, Draven in the arena, and here we've got much more of that framing thing going on we talked about. Like, you can see how his spinning axis pulled in, put in the ground kind of creates alongside the body of the Minotaur and with the help of the, of like the flamethrower things going on there, kind of creates a bit of a, of a, like a, a framing around Draven that kind of centers him in the image. Plus, he's centered in the image. Alistar race. Yeah, I think that might be a Minotaur from Alistar's people. <clears throat> Which, you know, ugh. But yeah, um, lovely the bit of framing here. And again, much like uh, with some of the other pictures we've seen before here, it's not so much that the light is highlighting Draven himself, but that the light is behind Draven, so that our eyes are drawn to him as the only sort of dark spot in the area. By the way, th that guy down there, he's gonna come up later. <laughs> <clears throat> Moving on to Dear Katarina. I'm still salty, by the way, about... Remember when they did updates for Katarina's splash art and, ev like, half of Reddit just got bent so out of shape because Katarina's face looked a little unused, like, it had a little bit of character? There was a little bit more to her than just, like, the pretty anime girl that they'd got gotten used to? I'm still salty about that. But, yeah, there's a little bit of... Because what they're trying to do here... 
they're trying to have Katarina kind of stepping into the image. It's kind of, it's Katarina charging forward, but she's also in a position of power over the viewer. Like, her head is in the upper half, she's looking ahead over us, she's towering over us, essentially, and we are very much low, below her, being, like, being dominated by her perspective, basically. The anatomy doesn't quite work. Like, I feel like her upper torso, like, she should be more bent over, like, in terms of, like, her torso should be more in front of this, but this is fly swatting. Like, there's a little bit of what's called fly swatting going on, where they're flattening the character's anatomy rather than... I would really have like to have, have Katarina poking more into the viewer's space there, because, like, this stretching right here, like, that so... Like, her ribcage is here, and then there's, like, a long-ass midriff, and then the hips is, like, it's not... Oh, it doesn't quite... It doesn't quite look right. And they're trying to do it like, they're trying to do this stretching in service of this strong perspective, like, where she's really stepping into the image, but it just, for my money, it just, just doesn't quite work for me. Um, I really like the idea. I like the framing. Like, again, you can see the, the buildings of Noxus are framing Katarina against the background. I like the use of bright white light to contrast with her flaming red hair. Like, that, that works quite well for me. But I just, oh, the anatomy here just doesn't make sense to me. And I like the Dutch angle, by the way. Once again, like, in film, Dutch angles like this, like, those angles where you can see, like, the, the perspective, the horizon line is completely dis misaligned with the perspective that you're seeing things from, help create a feeling of, like, being off-kilter, or, like, uh, like, literally being tilted, like, being tilted on your side a little bit so that you're not in balance. And that's being used here to heighten Katarina's sense of power over the image, like, that she's the most powerful thing there. Um, and that works really well, and it would work so much better if the anatomy wasn't a little bit wonky. And so here we see Katarina doing what's basically a Death Lotus, and she seems to be doing it to a bunch of Demacian soldiers. Poor guys! Um, and here... Again, the framing is really obvious. Like, you can see the, the falling b body of the soldier and those soldiers right there create a bit of a... a space, a frame, as, uh, uh, along with the effects line from her from her death lotus that highlights Katarina with the light in the face there and then she becomes the central character of the picture easy peasy but again like how long is Katarina's midriff exactly like what the well how her rib cage is here her hips are down here what is all this stuff in the in between where did that it's like a one piece character I mean also hell of a thigh gap you've got going on there Kata like there's some distortions to the anatomy here that where I feel like this could be better used on an action pose. Like, something that kind of communicates her spin. Because, like, you can kind of see them doing that. Like, if she had raised her leg a little bit more, and kind of, and there had been kind of a more of a twisted S-curve, like, to her, to her body movement, then you'd really get that sense that she's spinning around really, really quickly and throwing this fan of knives all around her, but... But again, this, it's not really that important. Like, because, like I said, this is the highlight of the image. This is the bit that needs to be right. Because this is what most people are going to be looking at, mostly. This stuff right here, it's like, yeah, you can kind of get away with it. But still, like, having her torso pointing this way, and then her navel pointing this way, it's like, eh, you need more twist in the body for that. Like, you need to... The anatomy just isn't there, really. But again, like, you can see, once, like, once the flavor text comes up, or when she's in the card form doesn't matter, um, but it's like, eh, just a little, it's a minor thing. TBC small waists, what in tarnation is that? No, not really, I don't mind small waists, like, I like the small waist on Cythria, like, I would have, from a storytelling perspective, I would have preferred if she bulked up, but I like it as a, as a, as an aspect of her characterization, it's, I dislike it as a default when other options would work better. Anyway, Vladimir. What a prancing knob. Um, but I like, again, you can see the framing of the image is very, very clear. I, again, the classic technique, light to highlight the character, and then, like, the lines of the image and the framing doing the job of leading your eyes towards him and making him the main character of the scene. And I like, I like that he has these two identical twin servants, like, like <laughs> identical, identical dudes just going, Oh, and here's our master, Vladimir. And then Vladimir walking out with knives on his fingers and knives on his sleeves. And I'm like, do your guests not get suspicious at some like at some point? Don't they go, hey, hang on. What does he do with those knives? Actually, why? Mm, 
What, 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 who is he going to cut with those? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no, don't worry, my dear guests. Everything's completely fine. I'm just, I'm just uh, cocking my shotgun for no good reason. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Oops, it went off totally accidentally. Just keep eating. Nothing's wrong, my friends. <laughs> Like, I just, I know that he's supposed to be an eccentric noble. Like, he's supposed to be some noble weirdo with weird fashion tastes or whatever. But it's like, that's Freddy Krueger walking down the stairs. Are you guys not even worried a little bit? <laughs> anyway, I like, uh, I like the blood red candles. Like, the, the red candles. I like the general aesthetic of the imagery. Like, everything in Vladimir's place looks like blood, like the dripping candles look like blood, like the flowing carpet coming down the stairs kind of looks like blood. Why does my boy Vlad look like he's 58? Well, he's like 150 or something. Um, I like that this kind of looks almost like, um, like it looks like Vlad's hemomancy, right? It looks like it's, it's this swirl of blood kind of pulling a spray behind it. Like I like the, the design aesthetic and sensibility of the whole thing. Because, like, you can see that in this, uh, like, here. The blood orb and then those those curls of blood flying out behind it. And you can kind of see that's how the banister of the stairs is designed. It's designed to look like his magic, basically. Which I think, I think that's quite cool. That's a quite cool little design detail. And then here's like, oh no! The man with knife hands has started sucking blood from people! Who could possibly have predicted this? <laughs> But yeah, anyway, this is this is then, uh, and again, notice the framing. Like, here he's framed by the rooftops of Noxus. And then, like, the spiraling of the clouds behind him. Uh-oh, sneeze. <coughs> I didn't know that talking for, two and a, for three and a half hours would make me sneeze, but apparently it does. But yeah, again, framing and then the the orb of blood that he uses for his magic is doing the job of lighting him for us. While everyone else, even though there's bright light sources right there, the characters behind him are not at all lit up. <laughs> yeah, he's got blades on his sleeves. It's one of the dumbest details about his character design It's the blades on his sleeves. They're so dumb and they don't make any sense. How are you going to cut anyone with them, Vlad? Honestly. I don't know why this all this talking makes me sneeze, but apparently it does. Anyway, hello Darius, you're doing something interesting again. Once again, <clears throat> light and shadow framing. Darius is not really framed by the background so much, but he's framed by his like you can see how the the lines of everything, all the rubble, all the stuff that's kind of behind him. All of that kind of leads your eye to him. Like, you can see all the lines kind of point towards Darius. It creates this little this little space, basically, like this little triangular shape in which Darius fits as the keystone, um, which does a good job of leading the eye. <clears throat> but what's not being used here so much is the light, because the light is all coming from what Darius has done, what, like, Darius' afternoon activities, like his, uh, his errands. What he what he's what he's been getting up to his little hobbies, that's where the light is coming from. And Darius isn't facing it like he's not looking towards it. He doesn't want to be illuminated by it. Not that he's ashamed of it necessarily, because he's wiping the blood off his axe with his cape. But in the sense that he's not really interested in it, like he doesn't want to revel in it. He doesn't want to enjoy it or you know focus on it. And that's, that's an interesting character moment because we know this about Darius. Like, we know this from his comic, especially, that he believes in Noxus. He believes in the Noxian ideals and he will do whatever it takes to protect them. But he doesn't revel in bloodshed the way that his brother does. He doesn't really revel in the slaughter or in, in the aftermath of his actions. He just does them and accepts the consequences and the responsibility. But he doesn't, like, he's not like, yes, fuck yeah, blood, kill everything, hooray, waha. And this, and interestingly, like with a lot of the other pieces, right? We talked about this one here. There's a progression from the first, from the level one to the level two. 
But this is in reverse here. This is Darius during the fight. This is Darius while he's fighting back these Freljordians. I think it's a Freljordian camp he's raiding or something along those lines. This is as he's beginning combat. This is as he's starting the fight. This is the aftermath. This is after the fighting is done and he's covered in blood and they're picking up their dead and the houses are burning down. <clears throat> oh, you got your Legends of Runeterra email now? Get in there, man! Get in! It's fun! <clears throat> and this is during the fight. This is before all the violence and action. And that's an interesting choice. Like, that's that's kind of interesting to show Darius at his strongest during the battle, but then show him <clears throat> weakened after. I'm not sure that's a, like an intentional lore choice or anything, but it's an interesting one. Uh, in terms of perspective, like, we get two very different perspectives on Darius too, by the way. Here it's like he's sitting down and he's kind of recovering and he's like, ugh, well. He doesn't look happy about it. He doesn't look ecstatic or elated. And here it's like... That's not really battle lust so much as it, I need to finish this. Like, this needs to end right the fuck away. People need to die right now. <clears throat> it's anger. It's determination. And again, much like with Katarina, Darius is put in a position very much above us here. He's looking down at us. He is in a position of power, about to bring down the axe, the Noxian guillotine, as he does. But look at this picture. Here, Darius is practically eye-level with us like he's he's on our level he's sitting down he's not vulnerable but he's not like super power like i'm gonna destroy everything and that's two very different moods on the same character i like that i also like this guy this guy is perfect and adorable and i love him a lot <laughs> and i really like that he, he has he has the challenger mechanic um He's got the challenger mechanic in game, which allows him to, like, uh, allows him to, you put him down and attack, and then he can challenge an enemy that he can, that he can force to block him. And the way that they're showing that in game is that he's just a really clingy little bastard. <laughs> he's just, he's just hanging out with the Noxians, like, hey, be my friend, yay! <laughs> which is such an adorable, like, imagine this guy clinging to Darius and being unwilling to let go, and Darius is like, I don't want to kill him because he's not a threat, but I don't want to be, I don't want to be, like, charmed by him either, like, really grumpy. <laughs> but also tolerating it. Oh, that's adorable. Well, not a lot to talk about here. Uh, light and shadow, as usual, the, sh the, the lighting around the edge of the poro kind of highlights him, but he's also just bright white, which makes him stand out in an image that's mostly, like, browns and reds and, and dark grays. And he's cute as hell. That's the main thing. Uh, why am I getting snotty? That's the worst thing to be. <clears throat> and here we have Draven's... Draven's biggest fan. And this is just kind of cute, isn't it? Like, this is this is kind of adorable. Isn't it? Like, he's doing, a, he's doing a budget cosplay of Draven. And he's, like, drawn a mustache on his own little face. <laughs> And he's like, you can see he's kind of doing the best with what he can find, like a little vest with some with a collar on it and stuff. Like he's he's really trying hard to be like his hero Draven. And I think that's very cute. Like that's that's adorable. And you can see a Draven poster hanging on his wall, and you can see he's got this sling, right? Where he's trying to practice doing the spinning axis thing. And you can see it's gone wrong a couple of times. <laughs> And you can see it on the mirror as well, like he's been spinning that thing, and he's been losing control over it, and it's been hitting the mirror, <laughs> and cracking it. And he's clearly in an attic of some kind, like he's up in the attic of his parents' house practicing this stuff. And that's just cute. Like, that that's that's just kind of adorable. And again, talk about framing. We're, we're not seeing him. He's here. This is, this is the actual real person. We're seeing his reflection as he's looking at himself, like, and that's... As, as, a, as a bit of imagery, that's really common for people who are like... When, you, when you're, per, you're portraying a character who's struggling with their own, own self-image, have looking at them in a mirror is, is a really common visual metaphor for that. And I feel like that's kind of happening here, like the kid is trying to see himself reflected in Draven. Um, which is funny. But yeah, when I'm summoned, move Draven to the top of your deck if you don't already have him. Draven follows his fans around. I like that a little bit as a, as a, as a, as a mechanic as well. Anyway, remember how we talked so much about Demacia that you, ne you never really see the soldiers' faces in Demacia? Like, the, so the individual soldiers aren't really that important? 
well, look at this guy. You get to see who he is. Like, he has a very specific uh, expression on his face, and he's a person of color, too, which is nice. Um, and, like, and you get a, a, a sense of his emotional state. You get a sense of him being kind of in trouble. <laughs> like, oh, my God, my axe is stuck. Shit, this is not great. While he's being surrounded by whatever the hell it is he's fighting over there. And again, unlike your Damasian artwork, where the soldiers were often lit by the sun, and it was like this glorious battle scene of, of like, of like, like angel angelic glory almost, a lot of the Noxian battle scenes are like this. Like, a lot of them are in the midst of combat with, like, fire going on and carnage. Um, again, you can see that, like, in something like this guy, for example. And the Noxian heroes are not so much framed as angelic, like they're not framed as righteous, but they're framed as powerful. Like a lot of a lot of a lot of what what they're showing off as is being very powerful, and you can kind of see that on display here. That even though his axe is stuck and he's in trouble, it's still this very like strong man pulling a thing, like almost like he's lifting a dead weight or something kind of pose that's going on with him. He doesn't look weak; he just looks vulnerable because his axe is stuck. And also, you can uh, speaking of speaking of Demacia, the light is also not used in the same way at all. Like this is the light of a fire, right? This is not the angelic light of the heavens opening up. In fact, it's overcast. This is the light of a fire. It's the light of battle. It's the light of of you know heat and death. That's framing him. This is quite nice. This is a, a spy legion saboteur spying on a on a meeting between enemies. I can't tell where these people are supposed to be from. I think they're Shuriman, actually. Yeah, they're Shuriman. Okay, so I think that's also the the situation that this guy is in. It's a sh it's a fight against the Shuriman, the tribes of Shurima, probably nomads and tribesmen. Anyway, I quite like this. Again, with the composition, you can see the frame being made here, which frames the soldiers that she's spying on. And again, lovely. Look at the detail in the faces of these guys. Like they're very different from each other. Very clearly so, which I quite like. So there's a frame here that splits her off from their space a little bit. Like, she's separated from them and therefore safe, but her arm is also poking out just a little bit. Like, it's poking out just a little bit. And, like, you can see her kind of invading their space a little and looking down at them and, and monitoring them. And then there's the frame over here, which only frames the light of the door behind her. Um, which doesn't really do anything because she's contained within this... Like within this block in the in the middle, within this separator in the middle of the screen, so she's she's an interloper. Like she's she's stuck in there. Why the boob cups? Well, because they want you to know that she has titties. That's why the boob cups. That is always, by the way, why the boob cups. The, from a character design standpoint, the point of any kind of boob armor is to let people know that there's titty. That's it. That's all it does. Is it announces that this character has titty. Sometimes you might want to do that. Sometimes there's legitimate reasons for doing that. And sometimes it's just because, Hey, there's titty over here! Titty! Guys, get your titty here! Like that. Uh, let's see. Anything else interesting in this image? Not really as such. Like, again, notice notice the judicious use of time and effort. These two characters are rendered quite substantially. This character is completely rendered out, but... Much of the rest of the environment, not really. There's not that much work that has gone into rendering every detail on this sword or these barrels in the background or these swords and stuff like that. That's all kind of flat, which makes the characters themselves pop more. Ah, hello, Spider Queen. So this is Elise's precious pet. And what I really love about this is the first time you look at it, you're like, oh, wow, that's a huge-ass spider sitting on a human-sized bed. But then you look at Elise and it's like, oh... Oh no, oh no, she made a tiny bed for this specific spider. By the way, uh, if you have arachnophobia, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but yes, Elise is from Noxus. Um, partly? Like, she's she's both Noxus and Shadow Isles. Um, and that's always been an awkwardness in her lore. But, uh, weirdly, like, this precious pet spider is from Noxus, but I believe, uh, Elise herself is Shadow Isles, if I'm not much mistaken. Yeah, there she is. Elise is a Shadow Isles champion, but some of her spiders are Noxian. 
weirdly. So if you want to play an Elise deck, you have to do Nox Nox's uh, Shadow Isles because she is both from Nox's and the Shadow Isles. But yeah, I like that little perspective trick. Like, I like that trick that first we see this beautifully rendered bed and we go, Oh my god, huge spider! And then we see Elise and then we go, Oh no, wait, tiny spider! Well, not tiny, it's like probably still pretty big, but it's not a huge, giant, enormous spider. And I also love, look at the little accessory that she's put on it. Like that little, that little veil kind of thing with the little chains. She's dressing it up. <laughs> she's, she's just very affectionate with her spiderlings, apparently. But yeah, again, the framing here is obvious. Like it's the, it's the curtains of the bed frames the spider itself. Then the light comes in from behind and gives us a light source to focus on. And that's how we get the focus here. And then eventually we notice Elise, who's not much more drab in her lighting sitting up there, just kind of adoring her little spiders, I suppose. So anyway, remember uh, the Draven card? The flamethrowers and all that stuff that happened there when Draven won? This stuff right here? That guy right there, I believe, is this guy right here, the Arena Battlecaster. Um, and I quite like this pose. Like, I really like... I like the hand outstretched and the fingers kind of poking towards the viewer. Um, I like... I like the like so the elation on his face. I like that he's looking clearly towards Draven winning something. I like the banners in the crowd with Draven's moustache on them. I like that there's this banner here, which is quite interesting because that looks to me like it's Braum's logo. And I don't know why that's here. I can also see Sin Shao on a poster over here. And Draven's spinning axes and stuff. Like, there's good little background details is what I'm saying. I like that they have these fucking f flamethrowers just as pyrotechnics, basically. <laughs> but yeah, as a character himself, he's not really that remarkable. Like, he's fine. Um, I kind of wonder if he is the same guy as the one we saw in uh, Piltover and Sawn. But he can't be, because he doesn't have that... No, they just ha ha happen to both have red mohawks. And now here come the gays. Ah. Isn't this just... Don't you just love to see it? Let's look at this for a while. Isn't this lovely? And problematic, but lovely. So, the... The, <laughs> the dunk I've been making um, on Riot for a bit now, is that there's more explicit gay representation in this one card image than there is in the entirety of Varys' uh, in-game assets. Like, Varys was this character who's like, oh yes, he's the spirit of two gay men locked in an internal struggle with a Darkin who's trying to tear them apart. But like, in-game, nah, there's no, there's no, oh, I must save my boyfriend. There's no nothing. No fuck all. Then Le Legends of Runeterra comes along, and holy hell, lesbian seduction scene. Holy shit. Actual, obvious, explicit lesbian seduction. Thank you very much, Legends of Runeterra, for doing what League of Legends has been too cowardly to do. <clears throat> so that's nice. This character, by the way, remember her, because she shows up later. Obviously, this is also, like... She's doing some kind of evil magic thing to this poor girl. Like, this is obviously problematic <laughs> uh, <laughs> in that sense. But it also kind of looks like this girl is into it. I mean, I'm just saying. So yeah, and again, I like the character on this on this girl's face. Like, look at the at the cheekbones that she's got. Look at that little crease in her face where she's smiling. Like, there's there's some character there rather than just a generic pretty anime girl face. I do like the composition as well. Like, you have this couch or whatever they're lounging on, and then you have them framed between these two torches, and the, and the, and the, what is the candelabra thing, creating this little space just for them, this little intimate space where they're interacting with each other in a room that's clearly very dark and cozy, like, and I like that the l bright light sources aren't interfering in that, like, there isn't really any bright light between them. But it, the, the light is framing them from outside. Like, that's a good way to, to draw an intimate scene, I think.
Anyway, she's walking into the room here. And I'm reasonably sure that girl... ...is that girl. Like, I'm, I'm reasonably sure they're the same person. With the only caveat being that this girl seems to be wearing a really tall collar. That I can't really see on this one. But I guess maybe she just laid it down or something. I don't know. But yeah, um, again, lovely framing. Like you can, you get the light of the magic in the front that kind of draws our attention to her, and then you get like the the rest of the scene. And something that's interesting about this rendering in particular, I think it's not quite finished. I don't think this card is finished quite because I'm looking at like around the legs and around this area in particular, and I'm seeing a lot of sketch lines that I don't really see in any of the other artwork. So this feels like a lot of this is kind of unfinished, actually. And maybe needed another pass or, through, or two through rendering before it was quite complete. It doesn't matter, because it doesn't decrease the quality of the artwork. It's just... I can, I can see a clear difference in the rendering level of the various uh, areas, which I don't see in a lot of the other pictures. Again... Very thin girl, but she's also supposed to be very young, so it's a little bit more... Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Anyway, those two will come back later. So, <clears throat> House Spider. This is a nightmare. Uh, this, this is a nightmare from my darkest memories and my most terrified sleepless nights. Because uh, this is a crib. We're inside a crib. There's a teddy bear there. And there's also spiders hatching all over the place. Oh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> oof! Which is like, ah, <laughs> I don't want this. <laughs> it's like a crib or a baby stroller or something. Is like, ah, oh no! <laughs> really, very dark, honestly. And yeah, not much to say because there aren't really any characters. Like the the teddy bear looks a lot like Tippers, doesn't it? It looks a lot like Tippers. Can I go back to the girl? Uh, sure. What were you looking at? I hope you got to see what you were looking at, because we're moving on now. Then there's this lady, a uh, Legion drummer. And here we get something that's a little bit more Demacian, a little bit more propaganda art-ish in its layout. Like, we get something that's a little bit more hagiographic, where we have this you know, character being lit up by this, these clouds being split open and golden light bathing them in radiance. And that lends to this feeling more like the kind of thing that, that Noxus would probably paint on like a recruitment poster um, for their armed forces. Rather than being in the middle of a battle scene. And it works quite well. Like, it, it works on exactly the same principles we discussed with Demacia. And again, you can see faceless Noxian soldiers in the same way that Demacia does. Which is something in contrast to the next one, which is a Legion Grenadier. <clears throat> now, my, 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 I think what we're seeing here is the opening act of the battle uh, that's portrayed in some of the other artwork. Like, I think the Grenadier runs into the camp. After, like, this girl spies on the enemy, figures out what they're doing, where's, where's the camp gonna be, blah, blah, blah. She passes that information on to, like, the, the, the Legion, and then they send this Grenadier in, because, like, these tents and stuff look a bit like what's then being fought in once we get to the Legion rearguard. And you can kind of see, this seems like probably the Grenadier was the one who threw those firebombs that started this blaze, and then the battle began. And again, that storytelling, like, that that, that goes on is, is really quite nice. But again, Noxian Soldier we get to see who he is. Like, we get to see that that's a person, that he has a personality, that there's some, there's something and someone there. What's interesting about this picture is that it's, for being a picture with a grenadier in it, someone who throws explosives around, it's really subdued. Like, nothing is happening. There's no one else here. There's no, there's no fight. There's no combat. There's no enemy. There's no threat to him, even. This is an unprovoked attack. Like, this is someone lighting the fuses of a couple of bombs, running into the middle of an encampment, and setting them off. <clears throat> Which is a little bit of a thing, isn't it? So, Trifarian Glory Seeker, huh? It's a little bit, like... 
<laughs> sexual dimorphism, huh? <laughs> but uh, if I'm not much mistaken, that's actually Kato. I think it is. I think that's Kato. Um, in the background, and we'll get back to him later. He's a he's a very large, uh, he, he's a large boy, and we'll get back to him later on. But again, uh, the framing here is actually interesting because the framing really frames him, like it frames the giant soldier in the background, but she intrudes into that frame a little bit, like she jots into it, she invades that space a little, and kind of claims it just by virtue of being there. And I like that we're seeing her in the act of like doing basic maintenance on her weapon, like doing the sharpening. <sighs> Armor design and League of Legends of me are never gonna be good friends. I've I've been ignoring it a lot so far. Um, I've 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 kind of I've kind of in intentionally not harped on about it because I've talked about it so many times. But you shouldn't have armor pieces that could stab you in the crotch if you bend over. Like, why is that spike there? What's it gonna do except just kind of poke you in the vagina? Like, why? Why would you want this? Anyway, um, I enjoy the character design here. Like, it's interesting that she's a soldier but also has this very well maintained hair. Which is slightly unusual, but I also like that there is that variety. Like, that there is that, um... Variety of hairstyles, especially with the women. I wish the men had more of them, too. Because I feel like women are the ones who only... Uh, uh, like, female characters in, in video games get lots of interesting different hairstyles, and then men is, like, 15 different versions of short hair and maybe a ponytail. Um, but yeah, lovely little scene here. I do wish she was a little bit more buff, but oh well. Doesn't matter that much. Good framing. And again, notice a lot with, with the, a lot of the Noxian, like, outside of stuff like this, these, these few ones here, most of the Noxian warriors, they don't have that angelic, um, that, that bright sunlight really kind of endorsing their actions, as it were. It is a much more, it is a much more subdued thing. You can even see it here. Like here, you would expect with, if this was uh, Demacians charging forward, you would expect to see like bright light illuminating their leaders and stuff like that. But here, it's much more drab. Like everyone is sort of in the same lighting condition. And you can see the framing here again, like this guy is being kind of blocked in by the other dude here in the foreground. By the way, having this dude in the foreground, I had a, there was an art teacher um, once who said that uh, Depth in a picture is the art of putting shit in front of other shit. And this is kind of a great demonstration of what that means, because, like, by putting this character... Oh, uh, keep up the good work I'm playing right now. Love you, buddy. Oh, thank you, Marchie. Uh, that's very kind of you. Um, by having this guy here, you get a real sense of depth to the image, and you get a real sense of being in the scene with the characters, because something... Like, there's something so close to you, right? Obscuring your space. And again, uh, remember that, that line of Demacians. Um, that line of Demacians where it's just sword shield, sword shield, sword shield, sword shield. They were all exactly the same. Look at these guys. They're sort of wearing the same armor, but this guy has a different helmet. This guy has an axe. This guy has like a... I don't know what the hell that is. A spatula? And this guy has a giant hammer along with it. Like they're much more individualistic. This guy has this red cloth hanging down between his legs, and this guy doesn't. They're not even wearing the same under tunics. Some of them. So there's more individuality and difference between individual Noxian soldiers in lots of these images, which I quite like. And then there's this poor fucker. <laughs> this poor smug-looking asshole. <laughs> he thinks he's about to kiss a girl. Nope. <laughs> he's about to get a different kind of kiss. And again, look look how much work the character design is doing to not make you feel too much sympathy for that guy. Like that that little that little that little crooked smile like, "Oh yeah, I'm definitely going to get laid tonight." <laughs> and like the raised Pixar uh, like the Dreamworks face raised eyebrow thing. He's, he looks a little smarmy. He looks a little like he he's he's one of Elise's many suitors who she's going to take to the Shadow Isles and feed to Vilemore. Um and it works well. And again, the framing here is is incredibly obvious. Like, we have the door. The doorway frames him. And the spider hanging above him is intruding into that frame a little bit with the claws and with, with its mouth parts. And then the light outside um, the door. 
Oh, how she captivates me. Her endless legs, voice of paralyzing sweetness, and eyes red as the rose. To think she chose to dine with me tonight. <laughs> oh, you poor fool. And again, there's a Yordle. Just hanging out in Nexus. Clearly being a Yordle. He's even got Teemo's collar on. Like the same kind of collar that Teemo wears. And again, here you can see uh, the framing is a little bit less obvious because he's actually being kind of framed by himself a little bit. Like he's being framed by the back of his chair and his ears. Inside this space right here by the light mostly. Like the light that's coming down from above is mostly what's doing the framing. Which is interesting because it leaves all of this space around here. Like this entire, like half of the image almost. Which isn't really containing anything of exceptional importance except... There's a couple of interesting things. Look at that. You see that scene outside the windows with the waving flags and the lights? That's because he's the arena bookie. So this out here is the arena. Like, this is all the action taking place out there that we're seeing through the window. And that's the importance of that part of it. Also, just showing that he has lots of muscle on either side of him that's taking care of him. But yeah, again, lots of good character going on here. Look at the expression on that face. Like, look at those eyes kind of gazing up right underneath those half-lidded eyes, and then this huge eyeball kind of poking out from underneath. Giant eyebrows, that swept back hair, that stupid little milady hat. And the rings, and the watch. Why does he wear a watch? Okay, I guess they have watches as well. Of course they do. It's, it's Hextech, probably. Hextech watch, sure. Why not? And then Darius on these pictures on the desk. I don't know why. I guess maybe he was a contestant in the arena at some point. But yeah, a, a lots of good use of light to frame the character and highlight him in the middle of the image. Then there's these kids. Remember her? Seen her before, haven't we? <laughs> but I like this guy. I quite like this guy. And actually, let's find, um, I think I had, where's the other one? There it is, Crimson Awakener. We kind of get the other perspective on the scene. There they are, those ridiculous kids. This kit was in the scene with these two um, earlier as well, when they were having their little lesbian makeout session. And I like these kids. Like, I like their, like, I like them. They look like a bunch of, of like, goth misfit kids. They're adorable. Um, so let's go back to uh, the Crimson Curator himself. Like, something I like about, like, I, I talked about this previously with a chef. It's nice to have fat characters in, like, a fantasy world who aren't defined entirely by just being fat. Like, and this guy clearly has more going on. Like, yeah, he's, he's a fat dude, but he's also got these vials of blood magic that he's just kind of slinging around and messing around with. He's got friends. He's got stuff going on. And that's nice. Like, from both a writing and a character design perspective is, like... It's so often when when you when you get characters who aren't that like the the standard fantasy archetype like either the the buff handsome kid or the scrawny kid or like the 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 skinny girl or whatever when they have any other kind of body type for their character designs and their stories to become about those things and that's really tiresome because like can't we have characters that are like more than just that one character trait it's so reductive so it's nice to see someone like where it's, yeah, big fat lad, but there's also other stuff going on. And again, uh, framing, I think the framing here is interesting because like he's part of the, of like the framing of the statue thing that they're sitting on, right? These steps, this pyramid step structure, and this, this creates this kind of frame that separates him a little bit from the rest of the characters. But in turn, he, alongside the stone steps, also create a framing that draws attention to the other characters, like to the friends that he's hanging out with. Um, which again gives him a sense of like, this is the character who's important to the cards. Like he's the main character of this card, um, but he's also part of a group that's kind of hanging out behind him. And a spectacularly bored lesbian kind of <laughs> over there like, oh, there's only men here. <laughs> but yeah, again, the light doing a lot of the work to, fr to, to highlight the character, everyone else is in shadow, so on and so forth. And again, oh, Jesus, oh, fuck, just a sec. Sorry about that noise. 
Ah, there we go. It's my desk. I have a little, I, I can raise and lower my desk sometimes I have to, ah, cause my back doesn't like it when I sit down for three hours in a row. Okay, standing up now, that's better. So, here we have a little bit more of that, like, again, the opportunity to do the Demacian thing, right? The Demacian thing where we have this divine light kind of condoning the actions of the main character of the piece. But that's not really there. Like, the, the light is behind him, sure, it's lighting him up, but... So is all the light of the fire around him. Like, it's not really, a, it's not really the same framing of the character versus the environment that you get in, like, for example, this, uh, that, that shot of the Demacian who's stepping on the head of that Shadow Isles monster. It's not really that same framing. It's much more of him among the scrum, him among the enemies, like, inside of the fight. And you can again see the framing being created by all the buildings and all the, like, and, and the scenes of action around him, and then him occupying the frame there himself. And I also like the detail of, like, having weapons pointed at him, because they are also lines that lead the eye to get us to look at his face. And again, Demo Noxian soldiers, we tend to get to see their faces. We tend to get to see their individuality and their personality. So, Reckless Typharian. I like these effects. They're a little much, maybe. Like, they're a little anime. They're a little, they're a little excessive, but I do like the idea of showing, like, him doing a swing around, around, like, a real super spinny swing, knocking down enemies left and right. I like the, um, I like the grass in the foreground, kind of, kind of giving us that super skewed, uh, 45 degree angle perspective. I like the light. I like the way that they're, they're, Okay, so his acts are doing magical strike lines through the air. Sure, we'll use them as a light source. So he gets these little light highlights from the axe streaks around him, even though that doesn't make any physical sense. And also the axe, like the, the circle created by the swing of the axe here creates a little bit of a frame for his, like his uh, upper body and his face to fit into. Also good contrast between the bright red and then the bright green of the grass. And here, again, much like with the... You remember the Silverwing Rider? Like, the, the Silverwing Scout? Again, the soldier isn't really the main character of the piece. The main character is this giant, badass lizard thing that he's riding. Although, I think that the, the dynamic's a little bit more even between them. Uh, well, he's definitely the main character. But you can kind of see it in this cut, right? Like, they tried to cut so that the soldier is the main character in the card itself, and it kind of doesn't work, because he's like, oh, he's just like this kind of stretched across the middle of the screen. But when you see the whole thing, it's the lizard that's the main character. Like, it's the lizard that has the expression. It's the lizard that's really kind of bringing character to the piece. And I love the swing of the tail. Like, I love that it kind of looks like it just made a, a hard right turn to charge towards something. That's pretty good. Oh, where's Swain? I need daddy. Sorry, uh, baby. Daddy isn't here. Uh, Swain isn't in the game yet. But yeah, the, li the lizard is really the main the main character. And I, I do love the physicality of these lizards. Like the big, bulging, like they're really super kind of ugly, over-muscled. Kind of like they've only been bred like um, like some pit bulls. Like some of those poor pit bulls that have like been bred exclusively for, for um, dog fights. Like, and they've been given steroids and shit. Like, that, that's the kind of feeling I get from these, these lizard beasts. Which kind of makes them look a little tragic, a little lumpy, a little misshapen, but also powerful and dangerous. And again, I feel like maybe they're overusing the Dutch angle a little bit in the, in like the wide perspective. I feel like maybe they're doing a little bit too much, but it works here again because it gives us that chaotic, um, in combat perspective that we kind of want, uh, from, from something as action packed as this. <laughs> and now we get to see why she's looking so bored. That guy is hitting on her. <laughs> like, he's trying to charm her or impress her, and she's just like, uh, fuck no. And her girlfriend is over there like, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I love these kids. I love them. By the way, oh shit, I should actually find that. Uh, wait, can I do that? Let me see. There's something I, def I definitely need to show you. Uh... Nope. 
There we go. There's something I definitely need to show you. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Designs. Where are they? Demacia, da, da, Noxus, Noxus, Noxus. There they are. Look at these kids. This is some of the concept art for some of the, like, the Noxian... Like, all of these kids, both the, um, both the ones we've been looking at and these kids are basically, like, Vladimir's groupies. Like, they're little... They're, they're followers of Vladimir. Like, they're sort of part of his cult or whatever it is. And look at this girl especially. Like, look at that. Look at that fucking 80s hair metal leopard print like she's right out of Motley Crue or something. Look at these shitty little punk goth... Frickin' teenagers trying to stick it to the man by being too edgy and different and pissing off their parents. I fucking love them. It's so good, look at this. Like, look at those styles. And here we have, uh... One half of our lesbian couple. And I think this is an early version of the guy we we're looking at that like, was sitting on the steps with him. These are like early concept versions of them. And you can kind of see how they're all kind of taking off from Vlad in terms of like that gothy Harlequin aesthetic that he's got going on. But they're also adding a lot of Saw Knight street punk kind of streetwear aesthetic into it. And I just I just love the these. Like look at look at this guy. Look at this fucking budget joker looking ass. It's so good. Fuck yeah, kids. Stick it to the man. And here's our lesbian friend once more. Fucking stick it to the man. Stay out past curfew. Make your parents mad. I support you. You are so fucking valid. Anyway, that was a digression. Let's get back to the actual cards we were looking at. And let me get my chat back up so I can see you. But yeah, they're followers of Vlad, um, and I just, I just love the, like, that shitty punk aesthetic, like, trying to piss off their parents, trying to do their own thing. God, fuck yeah, stick it to the man. Punk rock forever. Anyway. Remember how I mentioned, like, the, the, the framing of the statue that they were sitting on was kind of helping when, when it was this guy's card. It was kind of helping separate him out from the group a little bit. Here, you can see how that step... Like, instead of the steps going down, the actual steps, you can see how it goes down, and then it kind of follows the characters a little bit, and then you get this plane of the characters themselves sitting around, separated from the background, standing apart from the crowd, and the light, of course, also helping to do that. And I love the different attitudes that they have, like, the completely different, like, this, this girl is all chill and laid back, and kind of cool. This girl is, like, completely fucking done with everything, and this guy is sort of trying to be a smooth Lothario, and this guy is more interested in, like, whatever he has in his blood vials. Like, they all have different attitudes. They all have sort of different... Not, not, not just attitudes, but, like, approaches to how they are in the space that they're occupying. Which, again, from a character design perspective, and, and especially from... Um, the, the perspective of trying to do storytelling in an image, it's really important to have that sense of acting within the characters, like of being able to make the characters behave as though they are substantially different from each other. Anyway. Are you not entertained? He's a crowd favorite. I don't think this is the same guy as Kato, though. No, it's not. It's just a big muscle dude. There's not a lot to say about him. I'm not really that fascinated with him. He's just a big muscle dude, gladiator guy, like a hundred other ones we've seen in fantasy games before. He's got a strong pose. He's T-posing to dominate his foes. Um, there's light going on. You, you can see, like, between his weapons and his arms, he creates this little, this little space for his head to be in the middle of the frame so we can kind of see his face. But what's really kind of more important about this image is the fact that he's a gladiator in the middle of a giant, like, in, a, in the middle of a giant gladiatorial arena, being cheered by the crowd. Anyway, that's not Kato. Kato comes later. Don't you worry about that. Legion veteran, by the way. Speaking of queer representation, he returned from the war on the brink of death, restored only by his husband's touch and the apothecary's bombs. Noxus spared no expense to ensure his expert counsel long after his fighting years. That's nice. I like that. That's a good little detail. As far as composition goes, this is very much the same as uh, Scythria, if you remember back in, uh, in the Damasia set. He's being framed by the gates of Noxus itself. Um, and he's creating a little frame for his own head by holding his arms out like that. That gives a, a space for his head, which is also being framed by all these flying birds, kind of accentuating him. And then I really like that he's raised so far above the crowd that we can't see their heads or their faces, but we can see their fists pumping up in, like, 
celebration or ascent. Which I think is quite cool. Like, I think that's that's a really cool way to, to sort of frame him almost as kind of a prophet. Like, almost as though there is religious um, worship of the veterans of Noxus. Like, they, they're worshipped not just as, as returning veterans, but almost as as saints, almost as deities. Because that's the thing that Noxus worships, you know? And now we have Shirasa the Blade and her husband, Kato. Well, not her husband. They're definitely not dating. They're, I don't know where you heard that. That's a vicious rumor that's not true. We'll start with Kato. Kato the Arm. Shiraz is a great girlfriend, I mean friend, and we are in no way dating. But if we were, I'd like her to know that I wish her a happy anniversary. Thank you, no more questions. He said, what? That man has a break for brains. Can't fault those shoulders, though. <laughs> they are the best couple in League of Legends lore. I don't care. Because this, like, this guy is dumb as bricks. And his girl just fucking loves his muscles. <laughs> it's lovely. Anyway, this particular card... I'm... I have mixed feelings. Because I really like the bigness of the sp like the largeness of the space, like this huge, enormous space. I like the sunset illuminating the scene from the side, which really frames Kato, like his, his pose and his musculature really well. I like that she's in a frame that's kind of generated by the stands and, and like this giant obelisk at the back. But her pose, like, ugh, there's a few things here. Look at this bit, like that purple bit and then the metal bit. When I look at this card from, like, here, I keep thinking that that stuff is part of her arm. Like, I keep thinking that, and that's because what we've got going on here is a little bit of a tangent, a parallel tangent, where the lines of the character are not properly delineated um, from the depth of the character. And you can see her leg poking out back here, but you can't see that here. Like, <laughs> you can't, and that's like, uh... And so... I get the idea of what's being tried here. They're, they're trying to throw her, like, not directly at the viewer, but sort of just, just past the viewer's perspective. And it sort of almost works, but the perspective just isn't quite right. And the pose of the body, like, it just doesn't, because it kind of, when she's, look, when you look here, it looks like she's coming directly outwards, like directly out this way, kind of. But when you look at the way that her Lex is posed and the way Kato's posed, she's flying this way. And that's the same thing her her shiv is indicating. And I'm like, eh, uh, I can see what you're trying to do. And it would be really cool. But this just looks fly swatted. Like this looks so flat. It looks like it doesn't work at all, unfortunately. And that like that needed another two or three passes in the anatomy because like the it's unclear. It's not that it's like it, it might be properly constructed, but the presentation, the stylization makes it unclear, and I don't, I just don't like that pose very much. I also don't like that she's being thrown at us, but somehow her bangs are just, like, there. Like, they're not being thrown by the wind? Okay. By the way, the people saying that they're Ferator, have you guys not heard of Master Blaster? I'm just saying, have you not heard of Master Blaster? <laughs> anyway, this lady right here, again, the framing here is painfully obvious, right? She's being framed by the stage that she's standing on, and she's in this very dark space, but she's illuminated by a shard of light that really brings her out of the background. Very clear, very easy to understand. Um... I do like the, the the starkness of the Noxian architecture. Like, like Noxian is pretty much just black buildings everywhere. Um, but they're still brighter. Like, they're still illuminated compared to the ho to the group of soldiers in front of us. Where, like, they're still darker than that. So they still look like... I mean, they are in the foreground, but they almost look like background objects compared to the lady in front here. But yeah, this is just a per perfectly well-constructed drawing, really. I kind of wish that the banner was more brightly red-colored, just to kind of create a column here of her, like, under Noxus's uh, authority and power, but it's fine. 
and here we have <laughs> this poor guy. <laughs> this poor fucking guy. Like, Elise is right there. Oh, come into my parlor, won't you? And he's like, ah! Oh, uh, he, he expected to get laid, and oh boy. Like, poor guy. Let's see, Demacia is just racist. Well, yeah, I, uh, that's, that's a whole can of worms. How would I react? I would, I would not, like... If a girl, like, if a woman like Elise asked me to dinner, I would move to another country. Because that, no, you have to, you look at her character design. How do you not see it? How do you not? Anyway, framing, he's being framed by, like, the stairs and this leg of this spider right here, as well as that column. And then the curve of the attacking spider looming over him does a good job of framing the poor guy as well, but the main character of this piece really is the spider itself, which is most lit up and has that lovely pink backlight on it as well. And it's just like, the longer you look at this picture, the more spiders you see and the more distressing it becomes. <laughs> anyway, Himbo and his lovely 80s hair metal girlfriend. Kato and Shiraz of the Blade. And, like, again, there's not a lot to say about this guy. Like, he, as a character design, he's pretty basic. Like, he's he's the big fantasy um, gladiator burly guy. Um, but he's, like, yeah, the framing is good. You can see the framing, like, the, the, the half circle of the tops of the, of the stands as well as, as the building. They're creating this space for Kato and Shirasa to kind of hang out, especially Shirasa. Like, what's interesting here is, uh, in terms of the framing of the picture, these two characters are framed completely as equals, which I really like. Like, that gives a really good sense of their dynamic. <clears throat> like, that, that they are they are partners in crime, as it were. And of course, the, 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 the clever trick that's going on here is because we're looking at things from below, that means Shirasa is further away from us than most of Kato is, which makes her look even smaller in comparison to him. Which makes the size difference even bigger. Which some people are very into. <laughs> like, I tweeted out... Um, I tweeted out this and the Shirasa picture, and it got like a thousand retweets on Twitter from people who were just fucking thirsty for Kato. <laughs> I like this a lot. Like, as a mood picture, I like this a lot, actually. So again, um, the light here is being used to, like, this is the central character, so you can see he gets most of the light from the side there that kind of frames him and frames his character design. But also notice, um, doesn't that guy's face look a little bit familiar? Just, just, just a bit? Doesn't that look a little bit familiar? I can't be sure, of course. But doesn't he look a little bit like that guy? And so what I have to wonder is... Is that him? Or is that that guy's dad? I wonder. Anyway, no way to tell for sure. Again, the framing, you can probably tell by now. It's this, it's this like, space here that's being created. Frames the character itself, the light coming in gives us... And then there's, like, the color is also being used very efficiently here, because... We have two splashes of red here. We have this cape right here behind the person who's carrying the candle. But then we have the splash of, of, of red on this guy's cape, and that's billowing in the wind, so it's that much more eye-catching thing against the stark white and gray of the background that he's walking against. And that's a really, like, that gives a really good sense of, of space to the picture. I maybe would have liked him to swing his arms a little bit more as he's walking to really give that forward sense of momentum, but it's working really well. And again... This guy is super, super rendered. Like, they really spent time on the details here. And then the people in the background here, yeah, let's just... <laughs> let's just slap some color spaces down, and that'll be enough. Because the important part of the picture has been accomplished. And that's something I really want to bring across to you when you are looking at something like um, League of Legends Splash Art as well. Like, look... Take a look at the stuff that's been rendered with high detail, and then try and compare how much, how much of the image is rendered with high detail compared to how much of it is rendered with very low detail. 
And that's kind of where you get the secret to concept art in general. And just to like making art is like, you don't have to spend 110% effort on every part of the picture. Sometimes there's important bits of the picture and you can focus on those and just get those right. And that's enough. And that's something like, especially young artists, I see them struggling with that when it comes to like drawing backgrounds or creating crowd scenes and stuff like that. They, they kind of get stuck in, no, it all, it all has to look great. It all has to look perfect. And they just create images that are really, really busy. Sky and look at Shirasa's feet. Do that at your own time, dude. I, I don't have that particular kink. Also, yes, I know. Look at Shirasa's feet. Those are just boots, guys. She's not a Vestaya. Those are just boots. So here we have the, the Trafarian Shieldbreaker. And here, very intentionally, a lot of the Noxian soldiers, we get to see their faces. This guy, we don't, but there's a point to that. There's a reason why he's not got uh, his, 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 uh, his eyes out, and that's because he's fearsome. And that's a, that's, a, that's a game mechanic where you can only be blocked by things that have three or more attack, which is basically, it's just basically a way to get people not, to make it impossible to count on little tokens. Um, and here, like, that facelessness, like, those empty eyes, that empty, dark, almost maw, that open, gaping hole in his neck, all of that is in the interest of making him look more scary and intimidating, and it's working! Like, he does look scary as fuck! And because this mask is so small, it makes his whole head look smaller, which makes the rest of his body look bigger by comparison. And again, the framing is obvious, like, the soldiers that are running away from him, their boots, basically, and the ground gives us a frame around the character himself to kind of guide the eyes. And then you have all this bright red light, like these bright red colors behind him in the smoke that kind of makes him stand out because he's much more drab and much more restrained in his color choices. And those restrained colors, again, invoke the aesthetics of a horror movie, basically. Like the aesthetics of some kind of horror Jason zombie character coming at you, like stomping at you being terrifying, and literally everything in this image is just running the hell away from him, because of course it is. I like this a lot. I mean, there's things that could be better, but I like this a lot. Again, much like if you remember with the, um... What were they? The, the, the henchmen in, in Piltover and Son. You can see here, we have this image which is taken the instant they break through something, like right as the impact makes the, the makes the gate buckle before them. And that gives you this wonderful dynamic sense of stuff being thrown through the air. Things flying around like chaos, visual noise and destruction. And that works really well for the image. And I also like the expression on this guy's face. <laughs> he's like, he's like, he's doing it harder than the Doom Marine. <laughs> Uh, it's quite good. Like, and he's taking the hardest shit in the world. Like, that's the kind of expression that he's got. Kind of, like, I'm so angry! <laughs> Which is quite good. I kind of wanted them to have slightly more... Like, I, I feel like his pose is a little bit awkward. It works, but it's kind of fine. Anyway, what I really wanted to look at was the nose of the battering ram. Look at that. That shit right there, like, you can see how it looks like it's it's been dented because it's been hammered into things a hundred thousand times over and over. Those dents, like that kind of denting in metal, that's really fucking hard to paint, son. Like, that's really hard to paint. It's really hard to get those subtle little color alterations right to really show that, that kind of denting in metal. So I'm just impressed that they did that. I also like, you can see how, again, the framing is obvious. You know, the framing is, is here. But you can also see, right as this is the moment that they're bursting through the door, so you can kind of see the, the wood of the door that they're breaking through bending as it's being smashed to pieces, which again gives that sense of dynamism um, to the to the exploding nat nature of the thing. And again, the light from behind helps frame the characters that we're supposed to look at. <laughs> okay, Noxus is almost done. Hell yeah. <clears throat> Minotaur Reckoner. So I don't think this is the same, that, this is definitely not the same guy that, uh, that Draven killed in the arena. Um, but this guy's a hitman. Uh, and you can tell from all the targets on the wall who he has apparently eliminated. 
But I like that he seems to live in a pigeon coop or something. But again, framing, very, very obvious framing. You can see the doorway that he's standing in. Because we're looking from below, and because he's framed against the doorway, he just looks even bigger. So this poor little dude who's offering him money, presumably to kill someone, um, looks even smaller by comparison. And I like the bling. I like, because something I really like is, you look at this guy, and the first thing you see really is this. Like, this is where all the light is. All the light is on the gold and the jewels and the bling and, like, the, the evidence of his wealth and success. And then his face itself is much more in shadow, highlighted by the glowing eyes that he's got going on. And I like that. Like, that's a really, that's a clever way to, to frame someone as a sellsword, like as, as a mercenary, as a hitman, as greedy, as someone who works for money. So this guy, yeah, he's, he's like, he's Wolverine, like that, he's Wolverine. That's what it is. That's, that, that's what they're trying to do here. It's like, it's a Wolverine character very clearly. I do like the contrast between his purple hair and then his bright white whatever the fuck is going on with his facial hair. The pose is pretty good. Like, the pose just give, does give you the sense of this, like, frenzied animal kind of... Like, he's, he's kind of almost on all fours as he's charging around trying to kill things. Um, but, yeah, it's, I, it's not that much interesting about him, as it were. Like, it's a good pose. It's a really good action pose. It's quite strong. He doesn't really need a frame because he dominates the entire image. Um, I like the background characters. Like, I like I like these three guys, like, <laughs> these three football bros who are all shirtless in the background kind of cheering on the games. I like that. That feels very authentic to, like, sports events and stuff like that. Yeah, he's a Liefeld. <laughs> he really is. Like, he is a Liefeld. He is very much a Liefeld. Like, that, that hypertense everything. Ugh. Okay, Captain Farron. Oh, was that the guy? So that was not Kato. Okay, let's just, uh, let's just, uh, let's just, uh, let's just, uh, this is all the way back when here. So is that that guy then? Because with, the, with those things covering his uh, bindings around his waist, waist, wrists, I thought maybe that was Kato being suited up for our combat in the Noxian army, but no. That was probably... This guy, Captain Farron. But yeah, again, uh, very much. There's not really any framing here because there doesn't need to be. Like he dominates the space again with his with his uh, boulders and uh, with the spike balls he's swinging around. But the light is doing a good job of kind of highlighting him as separate from the rest of the troop. But this is again that thing that has that kind of slightly. Um, Slightly propaganda poster-esque quality to it, where it's like a group of soldiers all moving as one kind of thing. But yeah, whew. that's Noxus out of the way. I'm going to take another short break. I'm going to need some goddamn tea after this one. And it's between Ionia, Freljord, and the Shadow Isles for the next one. So, straw poll. Please help me out here. I'm going to make a straw poll. You guys can vote on which... Uh, Net, which one you would like to see next? 